right, it is time for reconstruction. We've now gone through the Civil War, and uh, now we're going to look at how to put that country back together after this big old war of ours. And if you look at these two pictures that I have right here, you'll see what the South looked like. I mean, it literally looked like a bomb dropped off and just destroyed everything in its path. And especially because of who? Sherman. Sherman's march to the sea, and he just burned everything he could find. So this is what their homes look like. This is what their businesses look like. And when we talked in groups about how are you going to help them get back together, this is what they have to start with. So that's a pretty tough deal. Okay. All right. So we're going to start with some background here. Lincoln's trying to put the country back together to begin with. He's starting to think about all this at the end of the war, and he has some real issues. He's first trying to decide who has the ultimate authority in this decision. I mean, once we've unified as North and South, who gets to decide what states come back in, what leaders come back in? It's never happened before in our country, and there is nowhere to look for it. Is this a federal decision? Should states be deciding that? So he looks to our evidence. Um, basically, we have decided, of course, legally, that uh, slavery will no longer exist. He announced the Emancipation Proclamation that freed all slaves basically south of the line in the war, right? And then the 13th Amendment that frees our slaves. You see the amendment over here on the your left, okay? Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, wherever the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the U.S. or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And then they put in there a section two that says, so if you see slavery is still happening, Congress can have the power to basically go in and force that law into action, okay? So under what conditions do you let those states back in? Some of you said they had to do certain things, loyalty oaths, um, all kinds of stuff. Well, let's see what ends up happening. Another problem he's dealing with is he has three and a half million freed black slaves, and how does he fit them into this big picture? They all have nothing, right? They're free, great, good for you, but they have no homes, no jobs, no income. It's like starting, you know, imagine a flood hitting a town or a tornado. It's like starting with that. That's really all they have. And then, like I said, the question is, who has the authority to make all those choices and decisions? So he looks to his evidence. First, he looks at the Constitution. And there is nothing in the Constitution about a civil war and what you should do. So that doesn't help. But he does know that anything dealing with foreign policy is under the president's umbrella. So if you're dealing with the South like a foreign country, then yes, he should make the decisions. However, who, in, who decides what states enter our union? Congress does, right? They're the ones that decide which states are allowed in. So then it would be under Congress's umbrella. So he's not sure who's going to make all those decisions. Now, Reconstruction basically has two phases. The first phase is actually during the war the war goes from 61 to 65, right? So the first uh, phase is 62 to 66, and that is called the presidential reconstruction, where the president is leading the changes in the country. The second phase is called congressional reconstruction, and you can guess by the title. Uh, 1867 to 77, Congress now runs the show because the president has no power. So they start making all the decisions here. Oh, sorry, I forgot to put little flippies on those. There we go. All right, so let's start with presidential reconstruction. <clears throat> this is what President Lincoln proposed to Congress. He proposed what was called the 10% plan. Easy to remember. Now, this plan is known to be a very liberal or easy policy on the South because, remember, he was the one that believed you can't just let the South go. We cannot survive half slave, half free. We must be unified. So he wanted to make it as easy as possible for the South to enter back into the country. Okay? So he said he would give these states over here citizenship to anyone who swore loyalty to the Union and to the 13th Amendment, which says no more slavery. And in order for the state to enter, they only had to have 10% of their states swear loyalty. Think about that. We have, what, 28 in here? 
So you three stand up. Hold up your right hand, please. Do you promise, solemnly swear, to be loyal to the United States of America? Yeah. And do you solemnly swear to follow the rules of the 13th Amendment with no slavery? Yeah. Yes. That is all that would have been required in this state right here. The rest of you could have hated it, hated the United States, and they let you back in. Talk about easy, right? But can you imagine what our radicals are thinking about that? They're furious, right? They want to punish the South. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, not going to go well. Um, and after 10% swear loyalty, then they actually have elections for congressmen. That's the next step. Oh, I'm trying to move this out of the way here so you can see this a little better. There. Okay. Um, they also then have suffrage for blacks, or suffrage meaning the right to vote. Um, now get this, though. He said blacks could vote that owned property, were schooled, or who fought in the war. Now, what, 8% maybe of the soldiers in the Civil War fought? Well, that's a few that would be allowed to vote. But how many blacks in the U.S. at this time do you suppose were schooled or owned property? Yeah, like nothing, right? None. So I kind of feel, I, I'm a little mad at Lincoln about this. Like here he's about equality, and yet look at what he puts in this proposal. This is terrible, yeah. Okay. So it was linked to intelligence. <laughs> Only those who are intelligent should vote. That's what you're kind of saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, we could compare that to immigrants today, right? Um, do we want immigrants who can barely speak English yet to be voting when they maybe don't even understand what they're voting on? You know, it'd be the same analogy, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Good thought. All right. Oops, I drew all over the board. I forget in this version it stays. There we go. <clears throat> Here we go. But here's the problem with that 10% plan. It is very unrealistic. The North was bitter. The war had killed about a million soldiers dead, 600,000 from the North alone. And this is actually a picture of one of the grave sites from the Civil War, just one of them in the North. So they're viciously mad, and they don't think that that's tough enough. So then what happened is our radicals <clears throat> kind of had control in Congress. Remember, these are extremists, right? So they led a counter-proposal to Lincoln's proposal. Uh, like I said, they were the anti-slavery group, and this was their philosophy. The South left the Union, therefore they forfeit all of their rights. They don't deserve any rights at all. And we should be much more tough. In fact, some of these guys proposed to keep the war going longer just so we could kill more Southerners. You talk about radicals, right? Extreme radicals. Oh, sorry, I can go back. There you go. I found, you know, I haven't taught American history for a few years. So most of my stuff is on transparencies on the overhead. So I'm transferring all of them onto the computer. So this is a new one. I suppose I could, couldn't I? I don't know. I'm afraid if I minimize it, I won't be able to find it. Yeah. Can I see it? If I minimize? Okay. All right. You got this? Okay. No? Not quite. Okay. All right. <clears throat> the next thing that's proposed is the Wade Davis bill. And here's what they said. They said that they would appoint a government to uh, govern the conquered states of the South to control them. And here's what they said. The only white Southerners who were allowed to vote were those that swore loyalty, number one, and those that did not fight in the war or 
work for the Confederate government. Well, think about how many men in the South did not fight or work for the government. If you remember, I think some of you took my America at War class. That was like, oh my gosh, I think they had used up almost 90% of their men in the South. So any man that was of age was fighting, pretty much. Fighting or dying, one of the two. So it pretty much excluded like three-fourths of all the men for sure. They also said that the states were required to write a new constitution. And in that constitution, they had to put in there that they would abolish slavery. They would take the vote away from Confederate leaders forever. You guys thought you were tough there, right? Imagine never being allowed to vote ever again. That was their proposal. And they would repudiate debts, meaning that the southern plantations that were destroyed and burned would not get any money back. They have to fend for themselves. Now, if you look over here on the right, this is one of the oaths that they actually had to sign. I found a bunch of them online, and they're really kind of interesting. It says, I, whatever your name is, to solemnly swear in the presence of Almighty God that I will hereafter faithfully defend the Constitution of the U.S. and the uni Union of the States thereunder, and that I will in the manner abide by and support all laws and proclamations which have been made during the existing rebellion with reference to the emancipation of slavery. So help me God. Sworn and subscribed to before me this blank day of blank 1885 or whatever year. They were all different years. So that's what they had to sign in order to be sworn in as being loyal. Well, obviously, remember, Lincoln said, we got to make it easier. We don't want the Southerners to hate us forever, but we won't unify again. So he vetoes that bill uh, with a pocket veto. And I'm going to kind of skip a couple steps, but here's what happens. Overall, especially in the North, people like Lincoln, so they go with his plan. So the 10% plan was enacted. Only 10% of those Southern states had to swear loyalty. Took the easy route. And then, you know what happens? Lincoln is shot. 1865, five days after the surrender at Appomattox. So now we got a new president. And remember that John Wilkes Booth was a Southerner who was not happy with the war, right? So President Johnson takes over. Andrew Johnson was the vice president at the time. Now, a little background about him. He was a poor Southerner, but interestingly, he hated rich plantation owners because he was poor, but he cared even less for African Americans because they were stealing the jobs from poor Southern whites. Kind of an interesting background. Um, the radicals, of course, hated him because he was a Southerner. Uh, he ends up basically upholding part of the 10% bill and part of the Wade Davis bill. It kind of unifies them in a nutshell. I love this too, how he's basically taking those rings and trying to merge the country together. So cute. It's a good analogy of what's going on. So how do the states react in the South? Remember, we kind of take it easy on them, right? Well, they react using black codes, because I'll be dang if my little white girl is going to go to school with a little black boy, or we're going to have blacks working or eating in our restaurants. They weren't going to let it happen. So they basically started passing these little codes locally, which is against the 13th Amendment, by the way. Uh, for example, they could basically arrest unemployed blacks. Well, think about it. How many of them have a job now that they're free? like none in the South. So if you were standing around and didn't have a job, they would arrest you and put you in jail. Uh, then what they would do, in order to get out of jail because they have no money, they couldn't pay the fine, right? So then they would take them out to a plantation and make them work on the plantation to get out of jail. You just got free labor for your plantation, right? Talk about terrible. They also forced them into annual labor contracts. Um, and unfortunately, like we said, most of these people are uneducated, um, they don't really know any other life in the U.S. So some of them actually signed contracts that said, yes, I'll work for you, and they would pay them a little amount of money. But they even had some that said, yes, you can beat me if I'm bad. So sad. Yeah, so sad. This is just one example of a black code from Louisiana. It said, no Negro or freedman shall be permitted or allowed to rent 
or keep a house within the limits of this town. They did a lot of that. No blacks in this town kind of thing. Like I said, they were forbidden to live in certain cities. They would have signs outside of town saying no blacks allowed. Uh, some of them were punished by fines or work for, and these are some of the things they got in trouble for. Insulting gestures. Well, that could be interpreted as anything. If a, a black person was caught looking at a white person, that could be cause for arrest. Uh, language, preaching, I mean, anything they could arrest them for. And that's where you see a lot of these chain gangs down in the South starting, and a lot of bad things happening if you ended up getting arrested. Okay. Well, what happens? President Johnson's a Southerner, and he does not one thing to stop these black codes. Even though the 13th Amendment says we can send people in to enforce it, he does nothing. You'll see here, this is actually an interesting picture. It's kind of hard to see, but it basically shows, yep, this is where the KKK becomes very powerful in the South because they were openly racist up through the Civil War. And now that it's illegal, they put hoods on. And they still do the same things, they just do it with a hood over their face. And a lot of these people were like the leaders of your town. Like uh, the Council of Brandon, for example, would be people like that, or uh, the governors, those kind of people. They were those kind of people. And here you'll see the council working with these guys to basically put down the black slaves. So what was the radicals' response? Remember, they want to punish the South. They are not happy. They want to free those slaves. So they tried to pass the 1865 Civil Rights Act that said all blacks are U.S. citizens and that Congress can intervene to protect them. But remember, we're in a battle. Johnson vetoes that. So that does not go through. So then the radicals come back, and they respond by passing in Congress the 14th Amendment, which says that African Americans are now citizens of the United States, which is what you see over here on the slide. So legally, they now have protected them. So here's what happens. As a response to that, Johnson says, well, I'll get you, Congress. He basically immediately, just like snap of the fingers, allows all 11 remaining states from the South back into the Union without any kind of requirements at all. Let's them back in. So then they have this standoff because all these representatives of those states are Southern congressmen, right? They go to walk into Congress with the rest of the Northern congressmen, and they won't let them in the door. There's literally like a standoff kind of thing, like not letting them in physically. Uh, and I, for good reason. These were Confederate leaders. One of them was even the vice president of the Confederacy. We really want him to be a congressman? Scary stuff. Oh, my goodness. My uh, freed Southern leaders would say, absolutely, we want him in there, right? So what happens is the radicals try to appoint officials to be congressmen for the southern states instead, and the president vetoes that. So it is a mess. So at this point, Johnson has not made many friends. Congress hates him, so they are now going to impeach him. Remove the president from office. And if you've read your article already, don't forget that that's due for Tuesday. Um, the House does actually vote to remove him. The Senate votes not guilty by one vote. And it's actually a guy from Iowa. You'll hear about it in the article. Amazing that the guy voted that way. Um, so now he's still in office, but he's what we call a lame duck president. You've heard that before? Meaning that he's still in office, but he knows he has no power because Congress can control him. And say that's not us yet, is it? So he's basically in office, but he has no power. So now Congress runs the show. So at this point, we're in congressional reconstruction, right? They enact martial law. And just to remind you of what martial law is, the definition, we basically send soldiers into our home territory to control them. So um, we've done that a couple of times. We did it after the Civil War. 
We also did it in the 1950s and early 60s when there was protesting going on for civil rights, stuff like that. We would send our soldiers in to control the situation. Okay, so they send soldiers into the South to force some of these things. Congress kicks out the old Confederate reps and they break up the South with this martial law into five military districts. Voters are uh, forced in those districts um, to register. The registration is done by the army and the only people who are allowed to vote are those who had nothing to do with the Confederate cause. Wow, maybe there's what, two in each town? I don't know. I mean, I can't even imagine how many actually got to vote because they all were in the Confederacy pretty much, unless they were working as spies for us. So uh, they also had to write a new constitution and say everything we wanted it to say. And if it didn't say what we wanted, Congress would reject it and you had to start over again. They also, of course, had to accept the 15th Amendment that guarantees all the right to vote. Well, it looks like we're being pretty tough to me, right? We're giving African Americans freedom, rights. We're kicking butt down south. So then why is Martin Luther King saying, I have a dream in the 1950s? What happened? Segregation. And how is that possible with this? Congress is tough here, right? Something's gotta change, right? And you're right, that's what happens. Something's gonna change. Of course, it looks like everybody's fixed and equal but we're ending up going backwards. The second phase of Reconstruction is called, actually, redemption. Make sure you know this word. Redemption is basically where the South goes back to their old ways. The first few years, we're trying to enforce things, but people get tired of it. So we're going to see what happens to make us tired of that. Reconstruction ends in the late 1870s for a few reasons. Number one, the Compromise of 1877 said we would withdraw our troops from the South. Now think about this. We asked how many years you would keep soldiers down in the South, right? You said five, three, couple months, right? Think about this. The war ended in 65. They got pulled out in 77. How many years is that? 12 years. They had soldiers monitoring the South for 12 years. Uh, the South now regains control of their government and they throw out the radicals in Congress. They gain control in Congress. In 1876, President Hayes is barely elected and so he's trying to make the Democrats happy. So he's kind of like a lame duck president as well because he's trying to make them happy and he does whatever they say. So the Southerners are controlling Congress. The North is also pretty apathetic by now. It's been 16 years since the war, and they look at it like a checklist, kind of. They're like, well, the South was fighting about civil rights. We passed the amendments, check, we got it done. The South was fighting about the right to vote, check, we gave blacks the right to vote. And then they also had the Industrial Revolution going on in the North, which gave them a lot more stuff to deal with. They said, we don't need to worry about that stuff. That was years ago. I mean, think about it. You are how old right now? 16, whatever your age is. Think about your age. Think about how old you will be in 15 years. If you're 16, that means you're 31 years old. Do you really think when you're 31, you're going to think about what's going on in your life right now, this no. year? Yeah, probably. You see what I mean? That's a lot of time that goes by. They are done with it. They're ready to move on. So they're focusing on new things. And by this time, the country as a whole believed Reconstruction was bad that it had failed. We didn't unify very well. We just kind of lived separately. Um, and it failed to integrate blacks overall. It really did. They basically had segregated them and put them into separate areas. But here's what I would say. It was successful for one main reason. They had taken the first step and they passed the Civil Rights Amendments. So now when Martin Luther comes out and he is saying, I have a dream, he has something to hang on to because legally our country has taken a stance. So at least we've started the trek and then he kind of finishes it. Now, I don't know if we're there yet. If you've been down south, you know things aren't perfect. In fact, right now with what's going on with these riots with the police 
and the attacks on on black civilians. Have you heard about what's going on there? Yeah, we're killing all of them. And now there are there's been what three policemen that have been killed in the last two weeks. Pro cop killing, yeah, yeah. They like threw like bodies. There's like people down south actually in Baltimore and so forth that have been like attacking. There's areas in the city where no lights will go because the whole Black Lives Matter, like the Wisconsin Action Movement itself, is weird, super radical part of them wants to like kill all the whites. Yeah. They're actually doing that. Yeah, it's scary. They don't feel safe, right? And I feel bad for the the officers too. I mean, they're getting calls to go to this particular house or whatever and they're shooting them when they get there you know it's very scary and i understand why um african americans are not happy about what's going on because there have been some really bad things that have happened i mean we have to admit that in fact for years if you got arrested by a policeman in the south you disappeared sometimes forever you know what i mean so i understand that that's there and i know that there's a history but man oh man it's still an issue right we're still dealing with this issue so let's take a look at what life is like for blacks in the South right now. Politics, they were allowed in politics a little bit, especially locally, statewide, um, as long as they didn't cause problems. They were a good African-American. They would have called them something else back then, but as long as they did what everybody else said, they were allowed. They also created gerrymandered districts in the South, and these were strange boundaries to control the black vote. Um, and the best way to show this, this is an example of it, but, okay, so let's imagine that this is all one county. This is Minnehaha County. And there's a really big city right here that has a huge black population. Well, you know, if you break up, let's say, um, here's what they would do. They wouldn't want this black population to be able to vote because they would vote for who they wanted probably a black representative. So they would break up that population and they would create districts like this. So now this population is broken into fifths or sixths and the lines were as crazy as you see on this picture. I mean, look at these lines. They're all over the place. They would do that to control the black population. So they didn't have much voting rights. They were forced to be allowed to vote but um, they didn't have much control. We also have what were, were called redeemers or bourbon. That's another name for them. Another vocab word for you this chapter. These were middle or upper class white southerners who basically tolerated black voice in politics because they didn't think it was a threat. They saw them as this, oh, what a good little black person you are, you know? And it sounds racist, and it was. They considered them inferior but they kind of took them under their wing like, oh, good for you, kind of a thing. So really kind of an interesting life. When we look at the economy, some things are happening there too. The cotton market completely drops out the bottom. Um, and we have sharecropping. We mentioned this before, where basically blacks are allowed to farm a certain area that they were on, on the plantation. They would get paid for it, but not enough that they could ever buy their own land or go off on their own. So they're basically getting cheap labor is what's happened. Um, like you can see, they're getting 10 to 30% of the crop, just enough to exist. And they can't buy their own land, so they never get free. They also had a crop lien system to control those farmers. Uh, local merchants, let's say they needed to go get tractors and equipment to do their farming. Well, they would basically loan them this planting equipment on credit, and they would inflate the prices so high that they could never get out of debt. So you got free labor, basically, or cheap labor. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit right now. Before I talk about this, I want to tell you a little foreknowledge. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about the theory behind why Southerners, especially like the KKK, consider the black race inferior. Some of this is a little ugly and a little racist, but if you go to any KKK website, they will spout this crap all over the websites. So 
Um, I want you to know where it comes from and where it stems from. All right? Racist theory actually started with a guy named George Morton. Uh, well, one of the guys anyway. And what he did is he basically took soldiers from the Civil War and he cut their heads open. They were dead, excuse me. Dead soldiers. <laughs> they were already dead. He took cadavers, cut their heads open, and he looked at the bumps and the ridges of the skull. He also measured and weighed the brain of black soldiers and white soldiers. And here's what he basically discovered. He found, oh, sorry, I guess I didn't write it down here. Basically found that supposedly the white's brain was heavier, therefore it had more knowledge, and it had more bumps, therefore they have more knowledge than the black. And he actually used that as like scientific theory to prove that blacks were inferior to whites. Another thing that you'll hear them use as background is biblical background. And I know a lot of you go to church in here maybe, right? You ever use the Bible as a racist tool? No. They claim that in the story with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they're not supposed to eat the apple from the tree, that they were tempted by Satan, and Satan came in the form of a black gardener snake. Thus, blacks are evil. Yeah. They also justify their belief, and I'm telling you, people still believe this today. They believe that physically, blacks are made for slave labor because they're stronger. Therefore, they should be slaves. Well, duh. Back in the 1800s, what do you think they were doing every day? They were lifting cotton bales. They were working in the fields. You think they probably had more muscles than a typical white who was working an office job? Of course they did. But they used that as an example of why they should be working manual labor. They also used Darwin. Now I'm gonna tell you right now, if Darwin knew they were using his theories for their purpose, he would turn over in his grave because I do not think that's what he meant by this. But you study Darwin, you know about survival of the fittest, right? Like, you know, the animal that is the strongest, smartest survives, right? Well, here's what he believed, or I shouldn't say, here's what they believe based on his theory. Um, that if we have a mixed race, as you mixed with the black race, it would cause your brain to get smaller. Because according to Morton, black brains are smaller, right? And so eventually, just like humans lost their tail, eventually if we kept sleeping with whites and blacks, we would, they would be muted out. And eventually there would be no blacks anymore. If that makes any sense? Um, so basically they believe that over time the white race would exterminate the black race. Crazy, 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 I know. <laughs> they view blacks almost like dinosaurs when we talk about survival of the fittest. Uh, and they even said, we have numbers to prove that the black race will be extinct shortly because they looked at the 1890 census that proved there were more whites than blacks in the United States. Well, they didn't mention that you have to look at the fact that this was a huge flux of European immigration so tons of our ancestors from Germany, Ireland, Italy, all those places were in the country. So obviously, that's going to make our white numbers hike up as compared to those that were there before. But they use that as justification. So let's take a look at what's happening in the polit political scene here. Um, the tough agriculture that we ran into creates what we call the Populist Party that we're going to talk about in a couple of chapters, actually. They actually uh, had a huge following here in South Dakota. In fact, they had a building that was built in honor of the Farm Populist Party. Do you know what it is? In our state, a building in honor of farmers. Can you think of what it might be? The Corn Palace. Yes, the Corn Palace was designed to entice people to come to our state of South Dakota to show how great our crops were. And it was to enforce the populist party. So we create a new party. We'll talk about it more later. What happens is that splits the white vote. And all of a sudden, now black votes matter because there's more of them and we're split. So they're concerned about it. So now they start putting black codes on voting. And they have legal restrictions on blacks throughout the South. So here's just a few of them. First of all, they have poll taxes. So you had to pay in order to vote, which meant that only rich people could vote. 
But think about that. That didn't just affect blacks. It also affected poor whites as well. So it became voters were only the rich people. That was kind of a bad deal. Um, they also did, there's more coming, um, some other things. Mississippi was really good at some of these black codes. Here are some things they put in their constitution. Uh, they had a residence requirement that said that you had to live in the state of Mississippi for two years and in that district for one year in order to vote. Um, and because a lot of people were moving right after the Civil War, they thought they could catch some of those with that restriction. They said you could not vote if you were convicted of any crime. Well, remember that they could arrest you for gestures, preaching, language. So most blacks had been arrested at this point for stupid things. They also said that all of your poll taxes had to be paid by February 1st. And then later on, you would have to come in and show your receipt to show you had paid your poll tax. Well, they were hoping that blacks would not be smart enough to keep it or remember those dates. So then they could turn them away. Uh, we talked about the poll tax already. They also added, and this just drives me crazy, they had a literacy clause that said you would give them a section of one of our documents, usually the Constitution, and that you would have to basically define it in your own words. Have you looked at the Constitution? It's tough and it's long. It is not easy to understand, and especially if you can't read yet, it's really tough. So that basically knocked anybody out that was black. In fact, that actually knocked out a lot of whites too, but they would usually let them go. It was really tough. Uh, in South Carolina, just an example, you couldn't vote unless you owned at least $300 worth of property or up. And remember, this is back in that day. In Louisiana, they passed a grandfather clause that said, if your grandfather voted, then you could vote. Well, none of the slaves' grandfathers voted in that state. So therefore, they could release them and not allow them. And this was all basically white power, and it was all a fraud, basically. It was all technically legal because they put it in their constitutions. But very much against the amendments. They also started passing Jim Crow laws. Now, I want you to see there's a difference, because I know a lot of people get this wrong on their test. We have the black codes, like what I showed you, and we have Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws means... Okay, yeah, we got to live with blacks in the South, but I don't want them next to me. So we're going to separate them. It's separate but equal. So they had separate restrooms for white and for colored. They had separate um, doors. Like when you went into a, like a, a store that you went to buy clothes, they had a back door for the black people. White went in the front. Uh, restaurants were only allowed white or black. They even had separate pools. In fact, I'll never forget this. I saw this in a movie once. It was, um, I think it was Chubby Checker. Great singer of the 50s, right? Did the twist. You heard this, the song, The Twist. He was on TV. He was so famous. And yet, he went to stay in a hotel, went swimming, and they asked him to get out. They completely drained the pool and cleaned it before any whites would swim in it. And from then on, they asked him to use the back door, and he was not allowed to swim. And this is a guy who's on TV. It's just crazy, some of the stuff they did. And the problem with that is we are never actually equal. Because if we have a black school and a white school, white schools got funds for desks and books and paper. Black schools got nothing, right? So it was never equal. Now, there's two really important court things that you need to remember. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson is the court case that said separate but equal is OK. Okay, and it starred this guy right here, Homer Plessy, who was only one-eighth black. In fact, he looks pretty white, doesn't he? He was called what they called an octoroon back then because he was one-eighth. I thought that was ridiculous. I had to share that. Well, here's what happened. He decided, because there were separate railroad cars for whites and blacks, he decided he was going to ride in a white car. Now, they wouldn't have been able to tell by looking at him, but he came and announced to them, I'm going to ride in your, your white car and he was arrested. All right, we'll pick up there on Tuesday. Don't forget to um, do your article. Sorry about that, we got interrupted by the bell, so let me just finish off this last slide. Uh, so throughout the South, we had Jim Crow laws, which basically said that segregation 
uh, was needed. We don't want blacks and whites mixing, but we'll have separate schools, separate restaurants, and things like that. Well, a guy named Homer Plessy brought this to the court, uh, the Supreme Court. It's one of your important court cases you're going to need to know for this test. This was in 1896. Now, Homer Plessy was one-eighth black, and I thought this was kind of unique. I'd never heard this word. He was called an octoroon in that day. I'm sure that's a very racist term today. Um, so if you look at him, he looks pretty white, if you look at his picture. And they said if you had looked at him, you wouldn't have known that he was black. But here's what he did. Um, in the railroad, each of the cars was segregated. So you had a black car, a white car, and things like that. So he was supposed to ride in the black car. And he decided he was going to go ride in the white car. Um, now, they probably wouldn't have been able to tell if he had just hopped on because of his color of his skin. But they called the company ahead of time and said, my name is Homer Plessy, and I am going to be riding in uh, the white car, and I am an octoroon. So sure enough, they arrest him, and um, they fight it. And here's what the court said. It basically did not back him up. They said, as long as it is separate but equal, it is okay. Well, here's the problem with that. Equality is never achieved. That black school never gets the same amount of funding or money as the white school. So the black kids don't have books and papers and desks and, you know, the white kids have electronics and crazy things, you know. It just never was the same. And so eventually we are going to hear about a court case called Brown versus Board of Ed that changes that. And that will be another important court case to keep on your list. Here's the sad part. This form, of, this form of redemption will not change until basically World War II. And in World War II, we had black soldiers that went and risked their lives and limbs for our country. And they come back home, and yet they can't eat in the same restaurant as a white, a white person, and they, they can't have the same jobs and, and things like that. And so they start bringing up that issue and say, you know what, if we can die for our country, we should out be able to get the same job as a white person in our country. And so that leads us into the civil rights movement of the 1950s and people like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and stuff like that. So this is the end of our notes for today. Thanks for listening.